When you close the deal, that's when everything really starts. Everybody wants to talk about the deal at first was like, great. The moment you close is the moment that you actually start executing your business plan. And you cannot have distractions at that time. Hello, and thank you for joining us today on the Gentle Art of Crushing It show, where we focus on learning and sharing with our listeners all there is to know about how to create success in our lives. This show stands on the shoulders of giants. Our mission is to empower and inspire our listeners to create the life of their dreams whilst having a blast in the process. Let's celebrate life together. Welcome to the show. All right. Welcome back to the Gentle Art of Crushing It podcast, the Passive Investing Edition. My name is Randy Smith, and I'm your host today. And I'm really excited to have Julie Holly with us today. Julie, welcome to the show. Randy, I am so excited to be here. Ever since we were we were talking up a storm, you know, it just seems like yesterday, but it was a while ago. And now, boom, podcast magic. Yeah. So for the audience, Julie is a podcast host herself to The Conscious Investor, and she is also the founder of Three Keys Investments. So Julie, why don't you tell us a little bit more about yourself and how you found this passive investing journey? Wow. Um, I have a really cool story. Let's tell it in reverse. I'm now, I've been for the last few years, a full-time real estate investor, fusing together a background in public school education and real estate, third generations deep in real estate, completely fused together, one harmonious life. But if we unravel that a bit, that meant that I had, I don't know, a couple of decades of weaving these two worlds together over time. So I followed mom's path into public, into education. She was not public ed, but I, that's the path I went down. And then I diverted and went into my dad's world and my grandpa's world of residential real estate sales and just kind of kept putting these things together. But some serious hard knocks in my early adulthood, we all know, your 20s are all about getting kind of knocked around learning. Your 30s, you're, you're like, okay, I got this figured out. Things are a little bit easier. This is fun. Your 40s are even better. I don't know what 50s are. I'm, I'm getting there. So I can't wait for 50s because every decade is so much better. But dang, in my 20s, Randy, there was public school teacher. And I found myself in this really a, a very bad relationship situation. I found myself then on a teacher salary having to make a mortgage payment on my own. I'm like, how am I going to do this? Well, this is like 20 whatever years ago. So nobody called it house hacking, but that's what I did. I'm like, hey, I got an extra room. I can rent this out and I can then maybe have $5 of discretionary cash, you know? <laughs> like, So that worked and it was great. And it's kind of that foray of, oh my gosh, like, I have something that I can work with. And then they start doing layoffs at the school and they're like, oh, we're going to lay people off. And I thought that I had been in a safe and secure career. I thought I worked for the government. The government doesn't shut schools down, right? But they do. And I did not face that. I did not get a pink slip. I was very, very close because of my seniority. I was at the bottom. I was close, but I didn't. And that really awakened me. These two instances right there really shaped my my view of where I wanted to go. And it's like, okay, I can't trust anybody else to take care of me. The government has failed me. Boo-hoo. <laughs> so I'm like, well, what am I going to do? So I left the education space. And that's when I went to, into the residential real estate sales world. And it's interesting when we start to see how our, our narrative, if we're willing to release, to receive opportunity, we really open up a whole host of options to our life. And so I'm proud of my, my younger self for taking some courageous steps as a single woman with responsibilities and taking a bet on myself even back then. Um, and then just by nature of those that really horrible uh, relationship early on, it gave me a heart to really serve and support um, people that are caught in the fray of life who are trying to get their feet back on the ground to, my goodness, I would not have been able to do first and last to rent anything at that time, right? And so my husband and I ended up having this heart as to 
what if we have this portfolio and we own and operate it, which we didn't know those words back then. We just knew that like, okay, let's be landlord, right? <laughs> now we have these fancy words. And in that process, it was, it was beautiful. You know, we were able to build up a very small portfolio, but to have assets, I was able to manage them. I was able to stay at home with kids. He went into residential real estate sales. So we've just, you can kind of hear it, right? This whole thing is just constantly getting interwoven and back into homeschool world. So that education in that real estate and managing properties, and it's just beautiful. But guess what happens? You have your second child or maybe your first for some people and maybe none for some people. Maybe it's a dog, uh, you know, you get some extra responsibility and extra mouth to feed. And you're like, what if this goes sideways? What if this single family place, <laughs> what, what if uh, something happens? I mean, if you're cash flowing a few hundred dollars a month and you have to put a new fence up, there's all your income for the year, right? There's anything could just take out all of the all of the proceeds all the profits could just be vaporized in one single moment or we always had great great residents but i started to feel that vulnerability we thought we had timed the market so everybody right now that is like i'm going to time the market and i'm going to only buy i'm i'm going to keep my passive investment you know capital on the sidelines and i'm going to buy at the bot you don't even know it's the bottom we we are deeply entrenched in real estate. We thought we had timed the market right to sell off. And then it went up for a couple more years after that. Sure. Right. <laughs> like, sure. What the heck? But that is actually the, that right there was what led us into passive investing. And so in that process of having this money sitting in the sidelines, I got really antsy and pretty ambitious. <laughs> and so I'm like, honey, we got to do something. This money cannot just sit here. It's driving me crazy. And he just said, why don't you just do some research? Why don't you get some ideas? And so, you know, you tell me, point me in a direction, I'm going to chase after it. And that's when I learned about uh, apartment syndication. And I heard Monique Calm, the first woman I ever heard on Bigger Pockets, as I was driving to work out in the morning. And it was literally like, I have my faith testimony and I have my real estate testimony. And that was when I could see, oh my gosh, my love of people, my love of educating and supporting people and my passion for real estate are now all one. And hence, never turned back. I've invested passively, we're active. Well, my company, my husband and I are not in the same company, same business. Um, he's residential real estate brokerage. He's, he's a broker owner. But all that to say is like, that same zest and zeal is still there all these years later. It's magic. It's fun. I love everything I do. This is Chad Ackerman, founder of Left Field Investors, and I'm inviting you to listen to our podcast, The LFI Spotlight. Tired of the Wall Street roller coaster? Discover how to invest in real assets as I interview syndicators, seasoned passive investors, and other experts every week. We'll help you learn about cash flowing syndications, bringing you closer to financial freedom. Visit leftfieldinvestors.com to listen to the podcast, subscribe to our newsletter, and connect with like-minded passive investors. Join us today. What an amazing story. That is, and, and what a mouthful. Holy cow. You really kind of brought that down into just, what, three or four minutes of a nutshell of your whole life. And what a journey. Holy cow. Going from terrible relationship to finding real estate and having this educational background to bring into it as well, which you can tell you have the heart of a teacher, which is really, really needed in this space. And um, I appreciate that so much because I think everybody needs to know about this passive investing space and you're just doing a great job doing that. So you mentioned a couple of things here that really kind of jumped out to me. One, you said, I can't trust anyone to take care of me, which I love that. So it's kind of the opposite of the victim mode. So you you take charge of your life and you take control and you make decisions and you go after things, which is amazing. But then you mentioned something called release and receive. Can you talk about that a little bit? I love that phrase, but I'd love to hear where that came from and maybe an example or two of your life there. That comes from a lot of life. <laughs> so I, I always have a mindset episode on my podcast. And, and so I'm, I'm obsessed, if you will, of with mindset concepts. And really, I... I've discovered that and lived that, that every part of life requires us, requires a willingness to release something. And it might be something we don't like, but it oftentimes is something that we really enjoy. 
So here's a fun example. I used to be an, a very avid rock climber. I competed indoors. I, you know, went up the cracks in Yosemite Valley. I'm like, I just was obsessed with rock climbing um, in college and early adulthood. And I realized I could have all the rock climbing in the world, but I couldn't have, and you could just name all these other things, because if you want to be good at one thing, you have to be focused on it. And so I realized, oh, I, I really want to get into biking and I don't have time for both. And over time, I could just see like, okay, I, I gave the rock climbing away, but guess what? I got mm -hmm. biking on the other side of things, right? And so in life, it's there are very few things that we are intended to hold on to deeply our entire lives. There are very few things. Most things are just there to for a tender moment and then they go on and they pass pass by. Um, and it's an interesting concept. So when we're willing to live an open-handed life, when we're willing to release things from our life and just receive them as a gifting, like, oh, well, that was a gift for that period of time. And now I can receive what's coming next. Mm -hmm. I love it. I love it. Thank you. That's a great, great example. I had, um, I did triathlons for a number of years as well. And I always say, be careful what goals you set for yourself because um, you just might achieve them. And I had set this goal to do an Ironman, which is like the the ultimate in, in the triathlon space. And I did actually complete an Ironman, but there was like a three or four year period where that completely dominated almost every free moment that I had. And yes, I accomplished it, but I also sacrificed time with my wife, sacrificed time with my daughter, sacrificed financial gain by focusing too much on that and not enough on the career. So um, I love that. And I like the with this idea behind release and receive, like this idea of almost surrender. Like I have, I have a similar kind of tenacity and drive and will that I exert and I get things done. Um, so it's hard for me to surrender things. But what I'm finding more and more as the business grows and I want to try to scale the business is that I've got to surrender or release more of my business to people that are better at it than I am and let them take over and take the reins to grow it. So um, thank you. Yeah, I think I, I love the phrase that will go in my weekly journal of, of really cool phrases to bring forward. So thank you. Well, may I add to your surrender? I, I have a relationship with surrender and acceptance as well, which is very similar, right? But when we surrender something, we also, we, we have to accept something and surrender. There's like, you're at some stage of that at some point in time. It's like, what do I need to surrender? What do I need to accept here? What's going on there? There's a little, as of the same coin with those. Yeah, this could probably be a philosophical conversation for another hour, but um, <laughs> that's uh, that's a great topic. Thank you. So let's do this though. Let's uh, let's kind of shift back to this passive investing space. And you and your husband, it sounds like you started going down this journey. You had some of your own units. You were getting some passive income, and there was some shift at some point where you thought, um, or actually. Correct me if I'm wrong. Was it single families, and then you moved over into multifamily, or what? Did, what was that journey like entirely? Single, which is active investing, because we owned and managed ourselves, so that technically is active investing. But once we we exited that space, we invested capital as passive investors, and that was so terrifying and so exciting and so many boy the feelings we had a feelings wheel i think i felt every single feeling that was on that feelings wheel possible right it's like we're wiring money to people that we really don't know i mean i literally so i hear this person on their podcast all the time this is years ago i'm like there weren't that many podcasts i'm like they seem legit <laughs> this seems like a good deal <laughs> By the way, it's been, it's the best deal in their portfolio. No joke. To this day, I'm still in it. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. And talk about surrender and acceptance, right? When you're talking about that process of surrender and control. Yeah, absolutely. That's one of the most challenging parts right there for, you know, stepping into the passive investing space, especially for highly driven, you know, high performers who are used to really creating the results that they want in life and realizing the results of their thoughtful, diligent um, efforts. And so it can feel counterintuitive, like, wait a second, I'm not going to be doing anything and I'm going to get something like 
my life had never been like that until I passively invested. It was always tit for tat. I do this, I get that. And so in the passive investing, that really was for me, I am a control freak. I will say it, listener, hear this. I'm allowed to say this because it's me. I'm a woman, I'm a wife, I'm a mom, I was a teacher. I am a control freak. I am qualified, fully qualified as a control freak. <laughs> and so, you know, releasing that control, trusting other people and realizing that the only work I need to do is vet this on the front end. And once I do my due diligence on this team, on this deal, I'm not checked out, but I mean, I'm really offline because I'm trusting this team to really bring it and send it on home. And they do. And I'm super impressed. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. Yeah, no, and I think that that summarizes it all. I, I came into passive investing kind of with a similar thing. We did a bunch of singles. We did Burr strategy where um, my wife and I were bumping heads because I wanted to control the whole process. And um, yeah, when we finally did the first due diligence on that first deal and hand the dollars over, it was kind of anticlimactic, really. You know, like we do all this work, we, we research everybody, we read all the numbers, we look at the decks, we watch the videos, and then we send the money. And it's not a get rich quick thing by any means. So you're getting your, you know, four, five, six, seven percent per month or quarter, whatever that is coming in. Uh, but like, I want to do more at that point. So I end up going out and I'm looking at more operators and more deals. And I take that obsessive personality and just apply it to the passive space. And I think initially I was, I was thinking I would be more involved even as a passive investor. So I'm curious, did you, did you have that expectation yourself or was it a, a challenge for you to really kind of step away and let them do their thing? Or what did that look like for you? That's actually a very fascinating question because I haven't contemplated that for some, uh, for a long time, but my goals, I knew that I wanted to serve and support investors, right? Remember when I had my epiphany listener, you've heard me say like fused together education and real estate. Well, so I knew what I wanted to do. A lot of times people are unsure if they want to stay passive or if they want to be active. And if they're active, what role would they play type thing? I already knew from the very moment, like I want to be like the most extraordinary investor relation manager uh, director on the planet. Right. And so I wanted in order to do that, I was like, I have to invest passively. I cannot, and I cannot ask people to invest passively and to do something that I myself have not done. And so I took time to walk all of this path of, okay, I invested passively myself. I rolled my 401k funds. I got involved with infinite banking. I, I just wanted to go down all these paths and like took a year and a half, you know, to just venture down these paths. Um, but with that first passive investment, I was honestly hoping to have a window just into how they did things. That's all I wanted. I didn't want any control because I was like, I've never done this and I don't know the nuances, but I would love to see what this process is like. Unfortunately, in this particular instance, and this is more often than not the case, I didn't really get the window that I wanted. So, but that's just, I mean, and so that was, um, not a missed expectation because it was something I wanted, but I didn't communicate and articulate that to the, you know, to the team. And so, you know, it all worked out. It's all fine. Yeah, no, that that's interesting. Cause I, I kind of did the same thing. I have this passion of education and teaching folks how to do this amazing thing. And I remember the first investment I made with a local operator, my intent was I wanted to be kind of involved a little bit, maybe like not in the decision-making, but maybe I can walk properties with you guys once in a while. Maybe I can help with due diligence. Maybe I can um, really dig in and ask a gazillion questions about all the reporting that I got. And what I found very quickly was that the operator I had chose to invest with um, was not as, as um, accepting of my desires to be involved in that space. So um, I think it's really important too for investors to know really clearly what the role is as a passive investor and um, how also to be a good passive investor. So the operators want to continue working with you. Oh my gosh. Thanks for saying that out loud. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well, with that, I'm curious. What are your thoughts? What what makes a good passive investor? Well, that is like um, that's something that every active investor will have something to say on. Not everybody will answer that, right? I would say I will say this. I will um, also add to this before I go into my further answer is that one of the elements of being an active investor is understanding and knowing who are the investors coming into this investment. Are they ready to come into this investment? And in that process, I'm, I have some investors that are hungry to learn and want to ask questions. And so I have a choice to make as, as an active investor, I can let them in, or I can say, why don't you, why don't we have these conversations over on this side of the fence? And then we can, you know, you can invest down the road type thing. Right. Um, and what I've done is, you know, really, I have a handful of investors that really want to know the nuances and I know who they are. And I think the difference with these particular investors is they're very friendly. They are genuine and sincere. They're not looking for problems. They're not looking to try to tell the team what to do They're It's genuine, sincere. I want to learn. I have had some investors that I have not received into offerings and I'm going to just say it out loud and they just simply weren't ready. So by that, I mean, if I'm going to spend hours talking with somebody collectively over multiple conversations and <clears throat> after, you know, many sessions, they're still at square one. That just tells me that it would actually be um, inappropriate for me to invite them into our investment because they're not just simply not ready. It's not a, a good, bad type thing. It's just as you just need more processing time and that's okay. But we as active investors have to be gatekeepers of every single investment. And that means guarding and protecting our time. And so if we're having investors come in that we can tell need more time to process. And if we're putting the dollars first and like, oh man, you know, I just want, we just need that much more money. We just need that extra, you know, hundred thousand dollars and we'll be done. Like, no, 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 no. <laughs> Make sure I we're very particular, like make sure that they are ready so that once the start line comes, because when you close the deal, that's when everything really starts. Everybody wants to talk about the deal at first was like, great. The moment you close is the moment that you actually start executing your business plan. And you cannot have distractions at that time. You don't, you can't have investors that are coming, knocking on your door, proverbially speaking, right? And saying, hey, what about this? What about this? What about this? What about this? It's the two-way trust street. And it's saying, I tr they're trusting us with their investment and we're trusting them as well, that they do trust us and that they're going to give us a space to go and do what we promised we were going to go and execute on. Awesome. Very well said. And um, a politically correct answer, which I think was great. Um, but but I think it's it's a valid point. I think it's something that needs to be discussed on the investor side as well, because at the end of the day, even as a passive investor, um, which you know I'm I'm invested in twenty some odd deals as an LP myself, I know that I need to be a good partner to these syndicators operators as well for them to want to partner with me. So for me, what it looks like is doing my part from an education standpoint. That quite often I will. I will spend time on their website, spend a lot of time with the materials that they they create in advance. So I'm not going to them with questions that they've already answered in the materials that they provided. And I think it's important for LPs to do that. And part of our process at Impact Equity is we always send deal webinars that literally answer 99% of the questions that ever come up. So a really good place for an investor is to start with a deal webinar or the investor deck. These are often 40 or 50 page documents and they have literally everything outlined and it's just a really, really good place from an education standpoint to start. So um, anyways, not to go on a tangent about that, but I think it's important that we do our part as passive investors to be good partners as well. So, so um, I'd love if we can to kind of jump into your journey today. You know, we went from educator to single family to passive investor, so now I believe you're actively involved as well. So what does that look like today? What type of offerings do you put in front of your investors? 
Um, what can you share about that? Yeah. So I've been a full-time real estate investor for the past three years, um, which is just a joy and a gift. Uh, we've done, I, I, I'm like, we've kind of done a lot of cool things. So we're part of, um, project that is ready to go full cycle in Atlanta, Georgia, where it was a, a, an office building that was converted into luxury class A apartments. And that also includes some small commercial and set a patio space that can be, you know, rented out by different, you know, people who don't live there and such. Um, and then if we just go up a couple states, you know, we've got ground up 144 um, luxury class A units being developed in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. So that's such a wonderful experience and opportunity to take raw land and, you know, to actually build. Like, let's go through the entire process. And it is a process. And, and I, I love it. I love every bit of it. And I'm excited to do it again once we're complete with this. I want to go full cycle on this. And then it's like, okay, now I get it. Because we, we all know we come back stronger. Like maybe it, maybe not full, full cycle, but let's get it up to like full occupancy and everything, right? Um, we have vanilla in the portfolio. We have um, 120 light value add cl um, class B units in Des Moines, Iowa. We have 123 stabilized um, class B units in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And we've ventured into, and so that's kind of interesting, right? So you go from everything from like a conversion, ground up development, light value add, fully stabilized. And now we're shifting into a new asset class that I'm so excited about because it marries just like my education and my, um, my love of education and my love of real estate are fused together. My heart and the numbers are now fused together finally um, as we pursue assisted living. Love it. Was there, was there something personal that really drove that decision to get into it? Or was it just simply a business decision or the numbers or? A lot of everything. So I've always had a heart for the elderly my entire life since I was a young child. I've just, I like old people. <laughs> it's a really, it's like some people just do. And I just have always been very curious about their stories and felt a very a tenderness towards people at that stage of life. And I never want anyone to be forgotten or lost. And I don't want anyone to not be cared for. So it's like my entire life, I've felt that way. When I entered into um, commercial real estate, I was curious about assisted living um, and I was steered away from it because it is so operations heavy. And, you know, the mentor in my life said, you know, <laughs> stick with multifamily because assisted living is super next level. And that was very strong and wonderful guidance. And I'm very grateful for all of the multifamily. We will always invest in multifamily, but we're happy because we invest in any place that is going to provide a resident, a home for a resident, right? Like that's our goal in life. So no, no light value, no, no, I'm sorry, light industrial or no self storage. Like, no, we want to help people. Uh, so going into the assisted living space, it really has provided that opportunity to see how we can really support our investors by bringing and delivering powerful returns which we're having and struggling to find in the multifamily space at this time. And so that kind of lent itself into multifamily is a little more challenging. Are there other asset classes? Um, and by way of a, a partnership, which is I don't do anything new all by myself. I go and I partner with people I know, like, and trust who have a track record. Um, and proof of concept where, okay, you can guide me along the way. <laughs> Cause how I'm like, seriously, Randy, I think you and I would both be like, if we lost our investor capital. Oh my goodness. Oh my gosh. Yeah. No so I'd doubt. rather have less of the pie and be partnered with the right people and protect the investors. <laughs> so. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. No. And I think you're, I think you're really smart to do that. And it's, I'm sure you probably did that in your first multifamily. You probably did that on your first development. Um, stabilized is kind of a mix of all of those. So that's probably easy, but I think really, really important to do that with assisted living because it is so operationally driven. And I've heard that it's, it's all the complexities of multifamily, but then you throw in essentially 
a hospital or healthcare into that mix as well, which is a whole different bag of challenges. So um, I'm very happy to hear you're leveraging some expertise who's probably done this tons and tons of times, I suspect, right? Also leveraging in and layering in even further expertise. So for example, um, our four way, our four way into it is uh, direct buying direct from owner and owner operator and being able to actually keep that owner operator on for a period of time to transition to even like add more dimension to everything and to bring in third party consultants to ensure everything. So you can layer in so many pieces if it's done well. So in, in this instance, the owner operators are knocking out of the park in most, you know, most facets. So it's like, yes, like we want to glean and learn. How did you create this culture? This is magic, you know? And so, you know, really drawing on and never the detriment comes and, and listener, I would encourage you to always list, ask this question. And that is who are the outside influences on this offering? It doesn't matter what the offering is. But unless somebody has, you know, a substantial track record in anything, there should be some people that they can lean on, lean on for support. Like, I think that the best decisions are made not in a silo all by ourselves. But if we hit the wall, we need to know I've got these three people that I can make a phone call to. And I know that they are going to offer wise, grounded support and advice as to strategies I could deploy on this. Um, and so, I mean, like anytime we start to think like, oh, I've got it all together. That's really like, that's, that's a scary moment. I, I'd have a hard time investing with anyone that's like, we've got it. I can't agree more. Yeah. So I, I think, I think it's such a good point there. You know, all of the folks that I invest with, I bring my investor capital to, I always ask the question, like, who are the operators mentors like who are they leaning on who are they who are they following who are they trending after um like who is their bench strength that they can go to and ask those questions when things pop up that you can't possibly ever imagine are going to pop up so i think that's such a good idea to bring to buy into an existing operation that has an owner operator that's willing to participate after the purchase and it just it gives you kind of the training wheels as you learn that industry and make it your own um, to be able to fall back on him, who's the expert, who's been doing this for years and years already. So really, really, yeah, great strategy. Thank you. And and I would add on to that, just, you know, a little bow on that one would be no matter how much experience people have, we all need support. I was recently at a very private, like a mastermind that was a very amazing space to be in with, you know, 13 other, I'm like, how did I get here? <laughs> I'm like, and that's the room you always want to be in, right? You always want to live in a space where it's like, I don't belong here. Yes, I do belong there, but it's like the level of respect, but sitting at a table like of that nature and you are hearing the conversations, I can assure you, Every person that you see that you think is the most elite investor has a table like that where they are exchanging ideas and they are getting sharpened. And it's like, if somebody is not doing that, they're not going to be elite and they're not going to be bringing their very best investors. They could do super great. Don't get me wrong. But man, I, I'm like, if your great is being limited, then you're actually not being your very best. Yeah. Yeah, I love it. I'm, and I'm hearing this theme of of mindset with you from the beginning of the call, definitely to this. We we are the sum of the five people we hang out with the most. So um, kind of a final question before we jump into some, some final small questions. I'm curious, what are you doing from a mindset and coaching standpoint that has created or, or is influencing uh, this mindset? Yeah, thank you. Well, I am the conscious investor, <laughs> um, but I worked with a high performance coach. Um, I'm currently between coaches um, and that's always good. Anytime you are working with a coach, you need to evaluate where you're at at different points and say like, and so right now I've actually been evaluating what kind of coach I was trying to considering a business coach. I was considering um, another performance coach. I was so I've been kind of trying to assess for myself, like, what is it that I need? What's, what's the gap that I have right now so that I can have the gain? And so um, I'm just like raising my current self-awareness so that I can see what kind of coach I really want to hire 
And if you're not working with a coach and if you get sticker shock listener, you're selling yourself short. Every coach I've ever worked with um, is more than 10 X to the investment that I have placed in that coach. Like you will more than get your money's back money's worth. Um, I also read voraciously. So not, I mean, if you read eight pages a day, five days a week, 40 pages a week, you're going to read a book every five weeks on average. So reading consistently and reading quality literature, it changes who you are from the inside out. And like you said, surround yourself by the best. And I have amazing people in my life. Absolutely. So they say the people you surround yourself with, the books you read, and the food you put in your body are the three biggest indications of what you'll be like in five or 10 years. So so I think that's a really good um, kind of prelude into the next question is let's talk about education and resources. And specifically, do you have any books or podcasts that you would suggest for the new or newer passive investor? On the Conscious Investor podcast, there are nearly 400 episodes, which is really exciting in and of itself. What an accomplishment. I will high five myself for that. <laughs> but episodes 365 A, B, and C, and I will continue to add to that, but 365 days in the year, it makes it a little easier for me to reference. Um, but those are all designed towards passive investor concepts. Um, and they're questions that I get often and we, I'm, Take one episode just to dive into what is the process of a deal? What does this look like? And so those are very supportive. And on the Conscious Investor YouTube channel, there's actually it's kind of kind of antiquated at this point, but it's a playlist on passive investing made simple. So that's pretty fun. It's been helpful for a lot of a lot of people. And trust me, it is definitely made simple. And I, I will have to go and redo a few videos. With, I, I made that at a point where, you know, I have a lot more experience now. So I'm like, I should probably go back. No, no, no. I think that's fantastic. But it's also, it's probably a different message for the newer investor through different phases of their education process as well. So that's awesome. Yeah. Very good. So, in, and just so I heard this correctly, it's episode 365A, 365B, and 365C. Correct. Awesome. Okay. So very good. So you had an episode where it was kind of the A's, um, the ABCs of investing, and then you did more and yep. then you did, got it. I love it. Great idea too. Really great idea. Once you get into that zone, if that's the zone you need to be in, all of those episodes will just be continuous. And I have some, um, concepts that I've heard from investors that I'm like, oh, I need to, I need to record content on that very topic. And they're short. They're not long. Perfect. It's just a Perfect. nugget. Love it. Okay. Now, are there any particular books? You said you're an avid reader. So favorite books maybe this year? I always say the favorite book is whatever I'm reading. But right now, I would say in the last week, this book, I'll hold it up if you're watching, um, The Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz. You can see it's all marked up. Um, this is like such a simple book. It's so profound. But The Four Agreements, I will read them because I think the world should operate. I, ha I am a person of faith, but I agree. I believe that if, regardless of anybody's belief system, if we could all agree to be impeccable with your word, don't take anything personally, don't make assumptions, always do your best. If we could just all agree to that, dang, the world would be uh, even more amazing. It's already a great place, but. I agree. My, my brother introduced me to that book probably five years ago, and we both read it every year. Um, absolutely love it. Love the author. He's got a number of other books as well, which are all parables, which are, I love parable reading personally. Do you like the alchemist? I did. I actually very much enjoyed that. And it's something I had heard for years and years. And, um, I don't know if I was intimidated by it for some reason, but when I sat down and read it, I absolutely loved it. Amazing fable and great for kids. I love the audio version of it. I have the book and the audio. So good. <laughs> All right. So uh, kind of a fun one. I'm curious, are there any recent bucket list items you've checked off your list or anything you're hoping to in the near future? I am going to get, since we're talking about books, um, I have a bucket list item coming up. I'm going to get to meet one of my favorite authors in September. It was supposed to happen in the spring around my birthday. And uh, there are two authors. One of them got sick. So Ryan Holiday, he writes on stoicism, the obstacle is a way, enemy, stillness is a key, we could go on. 
he's absolutely just insightful and I really appreciate his work and the dedication to it. Um, so that is something I've been looking forward to. I was actually like so sad when Robert Greene's the other author who wrote Mastery, another amazing author. Um, I was so sad when one of them got sick and they had to, but they rescheduled it. I'm like, okay, we still get to do VIP meet and greet. We still get to see, hear them speak, but it's kind of, ner it's nerdtastic. It's super nerdy. No, I love it. So um, we've got a lot in common. Ryan Holiday is one of my very favorite authors um, and Dr. Ber Benjamin Hardy uh, and Dan Sullivan, like those, those three authors together, like occupy 80% of my reading over the last couple of years. So yeah, I love it. Very good. Well, let's see, like, how can our investors find you? How can we support you and what you're doing? I love, and please remember, listener, Randy and I, we're here because we do love to serve you and support you. So definitely hop on our calendars, of course. Um, if you want to schedule time, you know, to talk about what your investing goals are, that's part of the process. You know, it's not just jump into an investment. We have to make sure it's the right relationship and make sure that we have mutual trust and we start cultivating that. And what's cool is if it's not the right fit, I know a lot of people. I know Randy knows a lot of people. And maybe you need a different asset class to, tr you know, achieve the metrics and the goals that you're looking for. We probably know who you need to be partnered with if it's not you know, with us. So I would say, um, let's make it easy. The back door to my website that you only get on podcasts is julieholly.com. And if you go there, it'll give you access to, you know, our investing, to my schedule, to the podcast. And it's just a wonderful way to be able to connect. Awesome. And Julie Holly, it's J-U-L-I-E H-O-L-L-Y.com. That's right. Well, very good. Well, Julie, thank you so much for coming on the show. I think, uh, as I mentioned, we've got just a ton in common, and I'm sure we'll continue to get to know each other more and more over the coming years. But uh, thank you so much for coming to the show. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Randy. I, I love, I like your book recommendations also. I like wrote down one of your authors and I like, I haven't done that yet. <laughs> Very good. Well, thank you so much. And to our listeners, as always, we continue, um, encourage you to continue the education process in passive investing. But more importantly than that, make the decision to invest in your first passive investing uh, or passive investment in the near future. We're so confident that you will enjoy the results so much that you wish you started sooner and start your process to decrease your dependency on your W-2. So thank you again for joining us again today. And we look forward to our next episode next Thursday with another great guest. Thank you. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, another episode of The Gentle Art of Crushing It. It was an amazing episode. We know we sure learned a lot and we hope you did as well. We want to take a second and thank you so much for viewing or listening to this episode. And please just know that we only ask for one favor and that is to make this life magnificent. Thank you, and have a wonderful day.